<laughs> point of order, Mr. Bone. Rate of point of order in one minute thirty seconds. Um, I, I think it's important, Madam Deputy Speaker, as, a, as a, on a point of order, that the public realises sometimes when the House is not packed. It isn't because the House is not interested in what they're doing. It's in fact there were Ukrainian MPs in, in, in the palace, and I, hundreds of MPs have gone to see them. So while this was a very important debate, and it was well attended, and I thought in a very, a very sensible way that the people put their constructive points, I do think we should make it aware to the public that in fact there are other things going in the House at the same time. Extremely grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his point of order. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to give him a direct answer and first to agree with him entirely on the point that he's made. It was noted earlier this afternoon that although we were having an extremely important and topical debate about Ukrainian refugees, that uh, the benches were sparsely occupied. It's important uh, for it to be noted, and the Honourable Gentleman put this very well, that in fact in another room in this place at that very moment there were four Ukrainian uh, members of Parliament who were most welcome here and that, that many, many, many colleagues, rather than be here at that point in the chamber, uh, had uh, gone to that other meeting, which I gather was extremely uh, fruitful. It is no, now, no, no, hang on, we, I, I won't take any further points of order as we've now come to 3.30 and I will hand the chamber to Mr Speaker. Statement Foreign Secretary Elizabeth Truss. With permission, Mr. Speaker, I would like to update the House on the release of British nationals from detention in Iran and, in parallel, the repayment of the IMS debt. After years of unfair detention by the Government of Iran, Nazanin Zakari Ratcliffe and Anusha Ashouri have this afternoon finally been allowed to board a plane and leave the country. They are on their way home. They will land in the UK later today and they will be reunited with their families. Morad Tabaz has also been released from prison on furlough. I know that the whole House and the whole country will rejoice at this news and will share in relief that their horrendous ordeal is over. Nazanin was held in Iran for almost six years and Anoushe almost five. Murad has been in prison for four. Their release is the result of years of tenacious British diplomacy. I want to thank our Romani friends and Minister Badr for their help in bringing our nationals home. And I pay tribute to the efforts of many in this House, particularly the members for Hampstead and Kilburn and Lewisham East. I pay tribute as well to my predecessors and my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, who have all worked hard to resolve this issue. But most of all, I want to express my admiration for the incredible resolve and determination shown by Nazanin, Anoushe, Morad and their families. I have been in contact with them throughout, together with our specialist consular teams. Their suffering has moved us all, and so does the prospect of them being reunited with their loved ones once again after this long and cruel separation. We secured the release and Murad's furlough through intense diplomatic and political engagement at every level, and we have stepped up these efforts over the last six months. On becoming Foreign Secretary in September, I made resolving the continued detention of British nationals and the IMS debt personal priorities. In my first week, I spoke to the families of the detainees and met my Iranian counterpart, Minister Abdullian. This was the first in-person meeting of a UK and Iranian foreign minister for three years. We agreed to work together to resolve these two issues in parallel. I dispatched a team of Foreign Office negotiators to hold intensive discussions with senior Iranian officials to secure the release of our detainees. Officials travelled to Tehran for negotiations in October and November. 
A final round of negotiations took place in Muscat in February, resulting in this agreement. Our ambassador in Tehran, Simon Shercliffe, has also been in constant talks with Iranian ministers and senior officials, and I spoke to Minister Abdullian in October to progress the talks. In December, I met Minister Badur, and I secured Amman's assistance in this important work. And in February, I held discussions with Minister Abdullian again to drive the talks to a final conclusion. We will continue to push with partners to secure Morad's permanent release home, which is long overdue. And we will continue to support other British nationals in Iran who have asked for our help. We will work closely with our international partners to urge Iran to end its practice of unfair detention. It remains and always has been within Iran's gift to release any British national who has been unfairly detained. The agonies endured by Nazanin, Anoushe, Murad and their families must never happen again. Our efforts to settle the IMS debt have also reached their conclusion. After highly complex and exhaustive negotiations, the more than 40-year-old debt between the International Military Services and the Ministry of Defence of Iran has now been settled. As the House is aware, this debt relates to contracts signed with the Iranian Ministry of Defence in the 1970s. Following the revolution of 1979, these contracts could not be fulfilled. I pushed officials to be as creative as possible in finding a way to resolve this situation, and they have worked round the clock to find a viable payment route. We have considered and exhausted many options in the process, but I can tell the House we have found a way to make the payment in full in compliance with UK and international sanctions and global counter-terrorism financing and anti-money laundering regulations. A sum of £393.8 million has now been paid, which will only be available for humanitarian purposes. The terms remain confidential to both parties. We have long said we would find a solution to the IMS debt. Now, thanks to the tireless work of our officials, we have found a way to do so. The repayment of the debt, in parallel with the release of our nationals, reflects steps taken by both the UK and Iran to resolve issues of serious disagreement between our two countries. We will continue to stand up for our interests, for the freedom and security of our nationals, wherever they are, and for an end to arbitrary detention. But for now, to Nazanin and Anoushe, I am pleased that in just a few hours' time, we will be able to say, welcome home. I commend this statement to the House. Senate Foreign Secretary David Lamy. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Foreign Secretary for advance sight of the statement. Mr Speaker, for too long, the Iranian government have been depriving British nationals of their liberty to use them as political bargaining chips. Nazardin Zadari Ratcliffe has been detained in Iran for almost six years. Anoushe Ashuri has faced the same fate for almost five years. The suffering they have endured during these years is unimaginable. The moments of laughter, joy and hope that they and their families have lost are irretrievable. The Iranian government is entirely to blame for these acts of cruelty. The whole House will be overjoyed that their detention has now come to an end and that Nazanin and Ashuri can return to British soil to be reunited with their families, to take the breath of freedom once again. We must pay tribute to their tireless families who showed extraordinary strength, resilience and courage in the face of unimaginable ordeal. I also give credit to the member for Hampstead and Kilburn yeah. for all of her efforts yeah. over so many years, and to the member for Lewisham East yeah. for continuing to raise these issues, for their tireless work in campaigning to secure the freedom of their constituents. We join the Government in thanking uh, the Government of Oman for their help. I also give credit to the tireless work of British officials, as well as the Foreign Secretary, for her role in securing justice. She sowed more skills in diplomacy than her bungling boss, who appeared to do more damage than help while he held her current post. There are serious lessons that need to be learned from this appalling episode. We need stronger international measures to combat the use of arbitrary detention as a political tool, 
to end hostage diplomacy, and we need a review of these cases. We need to understand what could have been done by the British government to secure releases sooner. I note that the Foreign Secretary says she stepped up these efforts over the last six months, and I give her credit for that. We welcome that. But we ask what efforts were not taken by her predecessors that could have been. A review must also consider what comments made by ministers indeed contributed to extended detention. It's also good news that Morad Tabaz has been released on furlough. Could the Foreign Secretary elaborate on the next steps to support his case? We note that there remain other British nationals still in detention seeking help from the British Government. Can the Foreign Secretary update the House on the latest number and what efforts is in place to help them? Mr Speaker, we welcome the Government's parallel announcement that the IMF death has been repaid. We have long called for the Government to find a way to pay back that internationally recognised and legitimate debt. What guarantees have the Government been given that the sum uh, will only be used for humanitarian purposes? Today, though, let us focus on the main point of this statement. The whole House and the whole country can share in the triumph of welcoming Nazardine and Anoushe home. Foreign yeah. Secretary. Yeah. There have been years of efforts and some fantastic people in the Foreign Office, including the leaders of the Foreign Office and the Foreign Office team, who have worked tirelessly. What has changed in the last six months is we do have a new government in Iran. And I was able, when I went to New York in September and met Minister Abdolien, to reset the relationship and be clear that we were serious about resolving the outstanding issues that Iran had and they were clear they were serious about resolving the outstanding issues we had. And I do want to pay tribute to the fantastic Foreign Office officials who have been absolutely tenacious in travelling to Tehran and getting this done in what is a very difficult circumstance because, as the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman is aware, uh, paying money to Iran uh, with the intensive sanctions raising in place is not easy, even though this is very clearly a legitimate debt. And I can completely assure him that we do have humanitarian guarantees. What I can't do is go into the details because that is confidential between the parties. But I have had this thoroughly checked out uh, across government to ensure that we have those guarantees that it will be used for humanitarian purposes. On the subject of Morad Tabaz, who I spoke to at the end of last year when he was in prison, we have secured release for him on furlough. So he is now at home, and that was a very important point we were pressing with the Iranian government. I know from speaking to him that the conditions in prison were absolutely abhorrent and appalling, so he is now in better conditions. But of course, we will continue to work to get him home, as well as other detainees who do not want their names released in public. Uh, the, the other point I'd make about Mr Tabaz is, of course, he is a trinational with the US, uh, so we do need to work with our US partners on this issue, and we are talking to him. But in the spirit of uh, what, what he said about welcoming the families home, that should really be our focus today. They have been through an appalling ordeal. I can't imagine what it is like to be without my family, my, my mother, for so long. And we must give the families the privacy uh, they deserve, and we must thank them for their tenacity through this appalling ordeal that should never happen to anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, um, I'm hugely grateful for the extraordinarily welcome news that my right honourable friend has brought to the House this afternoon. It is the most wonderful uh, moment for many of us who have been campaigning, but particularly, and I pay huge tribute for the two honourable members opposite, for Hampstead and Kilburn and for Lewisham East, but also for our friend uh, Anne Cluid, who spent an awful lot of time campaigning for this as well when she was in this House. May I ask whether or not the Government has been looking at some of the implications that happened when the last time uh, a ransom payment was paid to the Iranian Government? And that ransom payment was paid by the US Government a number of years ago. About six months after they were paid, uh, the Iranian Government took another six American dual nationals hostage and merely started the whole process again. Sadly, furthermore, the money that was paid was then spent on murdering hundreds of thousands of Sunni 
Muslims in Syria. Can she assure us that that will not happen this time, that British citizens will be very carefully warned of the dangers they face in visiting Iran, and that none of this payment will end up in weapons and ammunition to kill Syrians? Well, first, it's very important to note that these are two parallel issues in our bilateral relationship, namely settling the IMS debt, which is a legitimate debt that the UK Government were due to pay, as well as settling the issue of the detainees. I am very clear that we need to work with our international partners to end the practice of arbitrary detention. In fact, we are joining a group with the Canadians and others to do just that. So we have a strong international response to the practice of arbitrary detention being used by countries uh, to get their own way. So I completely agree uh, with my honourable friend. We need to end this practice. We need to end this practice working with partners. It's a key point uh, that we're discussing as part of the G7 foreign minister's track. SNP spokesperson Alan Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd also thank the Foreign Secretary for citing the statement. And uh, goodness, in a week when we could all be doing with a bit of good news, I was very glad to read it. Uh, the SNP shares the happiness at the release of uh, Nazanin Zahari Radcliffe, Anushi Ashuri, and uh, Murad Takhbad. Uh, we'd also pay tribute to their friends and their families and themselves for putting up with an intolerable situation. And this has been a long time coming, and I think there are lessons to learn, but I think the Foreign Secretary, her ministers and officials deserve their moment on this. This has been a great achievement, and I'm very glad to see that happen. And, and the, the news that the historic debt uh, is going to be paid as humanitarian aid, well, I proposed that from this place on the 16th of November 2021, so I can hardly quibble that it's happened. I'm glad of the assurances that uh, it will go to humanitarian purposes, and I'll take that on trust, which I think we're all entitled to do. But I've got two questions. Uh, the, the, the first is, how many dual nationals are in Iran in this situation? Because we're aware there are some, but we don't know how many specifically there are. And also what wider assessment there are of other dual nationals in this position elsewhere. And also I'd echo the concerns of the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee that uh, there is a risk of moral hazard in this, uh, where I think we're all agreed that this is historic debt that needed to be repaid. Others could take other lessons from this. And what, risk, what assessment has been made of the risk of moral hazard to people, British citizens, going to Iran, but also in other places of risk, and perhaps the Foreign Office guidance needs to be updated in those situations. I'd be grateful for an update on that as well, but congratulations. Thank you. Well, on the, on the Honourable Gentleman's first point, I'm afraid I can't comment on individual cases, and even to the extent of talking about the numbers of individual cases, I'm afraid I can't do that. The Honourable Gentleman is right that we do need to work against arbitrary detention. The best way to do that is part of an international compact. That's why we're addressing this issue at the G7. That's why I welcome the Canadians' leadership on the issue. And I've met my Canadian counterpart on several occasions and talked about how we move this forward to change the incentives. You know, what we need to do is fundamentally change the incentives for governments so there is not an incentive to behave in this way. Jeremy Hunt. Can I salute the leadership of the Foreign Secretary on this issue? As I know from my own experience, this is a fearsomely difficult diplomatic challenge, and it wouldn't have been solved without sustained personal interest right from the top, and she deserves great credit for that. Can I, most of all, though, commend the efforts of Richard Radcliffe, Nazanin's husband, his quiet courage, his humility, his total determination never wavered throughout six years of hell, and I think he was really the bravest person I met during my time as Foreign Secretary and an inspiration to many people. And can I ask the Foreign Secretary, is she inspired by the united Western response to the crisis in Ukraine? And is there something we can learn from that to unite as democratic countries to stamp out the vile practice of hostage taking? Yeah, yeah. Well, my right honourable friend is absolutely right about Richard Ratcliffe and the families of the detainees and the courage that they have shown in the face of appalling adversity, as well as those detained themselves who have really gone through incredible hardship. Uh, and difficulty, and just not knowing uh, what the future would look like. And I pay tribute to the work 
my right honourable friend did when he was Foreign Secretary and the leadership he has also shown uh, in, in his current role on this issue. He is completely right. You know, this is why we are working with allies like the Canadians on the issue of unfair detention, because we need to take a common stance. And the way we have worked together on Ukraine, uh, on sanctions, on supplying defensive aid to, uh, to Ukraine, shows that we can do this in other areas and really stand up for freedom and democracy and the rules-based international order and change the fundamental incentives that regimes like this have in terms of the way they behave. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this is really uh, a day of celebration for the Anouche family, and I think they will be so relieved when the plane hits the ground and uh, both Nazanin and Ashuri are walking again on British soil. Um, and as Anouche's Member of Parliament, I am, of course, thrilled beyond belief for his release and for Nazanin. And I'm incredibly happy for Anouche's wife, Sherry, for his children, Elika and Ariane, as well as for their families and friends. And today I spoke to Sherry. Indeed, I've been speaking to her um, uh, yesterday as well. And um, she tells me that she has had several years of heartache and separation. And, of course, all of this could have been avoided. It is right that the issue of the long-standing debt of uh, approximately £400 million was addressed and returned by the British Government to secure the freedom of our British citizens. And I, um, I do salute as well the Foreign Secretary for making the IMS debt her priority, and I thank her for that. But I would also like to say that it has been over 1,650 days since Anouche was detained, and these are days of his life that cannot be returned to him. I would therefore like to ask the Right Honourable Member why it has taken so long for the Government to secure Nazanin and Anouche's release. Well, I'd like to pay tribute to the Honourable Lady for her tireless campaigning uh, on this issue. and I share her sense of anxiety, and there were some very anxious moments this afternoon as we waited for wheels up. Uh, in Tehran as the plane departed, and we knew that finally uh, our detainees and Nazanin and Nouche would be returning back to the United Kingdom, and we're very much looking forward to welcoming them uh, later on today. And I too have spoken to the family, to Sherry, and I know how hard it has been for the families and you know, the courage that they have shown uh, over these very, very difficult years. What I will say about the process of securing uh, the release of our detainees is the Foreign Secretaries, the Prime Minister, Foreign Office officials have worked tirelessly on this. You know, there really is a very, very dedicated team at the Foreign Office. Uh, last summer, we saw a new government in place in Iran. It did give us an opportunity to start afresh on some of these issues, to look at new ways uh, we could do things in terms of paying uh, the IMS debt, and we have been able to deliver on this. But we have to remember that fundamentally it was the Iranian government who put these people in detention. And ultimately, what we need to do, as many members across this House have been saying, is change the incentives on government. So taking detainees unfairly is not seen uh, as something that is a proposition. Uh, in the modern world. But I, I do pay tribute to Foreign Office officials who have worked tirelessly for years to make this happen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The daughter of Murad Tabaz is my constituent, and I would like to pay tribute to the Foreign Secretary and her team for all of her efforts. Can my right honourable friend assure me that she and her team will continue to work with the US in order to ensure that he may leave Iran? And can she tell me practically what being on furlough from prison entails? The Tabaz family uh, and I have spoken today. Uh, it is a very, very uh, difficult situation. Morad Tabaz is, of course, a tri-national, uh, US, UK and Iranian and the Iranian government do treat him as being a US national as well as a uh, UK national. 
we push very hard to get Morad out of prison. And I spoke to him when, in, when he was in prison, and he, he was in appalling conditions. And I'm pleased to say that I have been in touch today, and he is now back at his house uh, with, with security uh, in place. But he is back at his house with his family in Tehran. Now, we will continue to work uh, to get him back home. And we will be working with our allies, including the United States, uh, to make that happen. But I am pleased that we have been able uh, to secure his release from prison and return home in Tehran. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think we've all been quite emotional today. Um, tears of joy, I hope, are going to be cried this evening. And to think that Richard Ratcliffe will be able to welcome Nazanin, and she might even put Gabriella to bed or even take her to school tomorrow for the first time. What a thought. The £400 million that has been paid as the legitimate debt we'd been told for a long time was not linked. Well, I'm glad that it's been paid, and I'm glad that in any way it's led to their release. What I asked the Foreign Secretary is that's not an insignificant sum in the context of ODA spend. Can she assure that there would, this not going to count towards our ODA spend and comes over on top of other planned spending? Well, I can assure the Honourable Lady that this comes from the Ministry of Defence. So the Ministry of Defence, it's a long-standing debt uh, that the Ministry of Defence have, have paid uh, in accordance with uh, the international rules, including ensuring that this money is going to be spent on humanitarian purposes. And I am you know, pleased that uh, Richard and Gabriella, who are in the gallery today, uh, will be able to see, uh, see Nazanin again this evening. And I pay tribute to Richard uh, and Gabriella for their fortitude in such appalling, appalling circumstances. Mr. Speaker, at a time when every day we're reminded of the amazing resilience of a country, this is a great moment to be reminded of the resilience of individuals and families, and the particular families of the detainees who are coming back this evening. What an amazing achievement by everybody involved. I think it would be fair to also thank the Iranians, the new Iranian government, for their role in this as well. Could my right honourable friend confirm whether there are any lessons that we need to learn about dual nationals and advice given to them in travelling not just to Iran but to other countries? And could she also confirm whether the agreement that she's reached with her Iranian counterpart provides some form of pathway for other British detainees in Iran eventually to return to? Well, of course, we will you know, look to make sure that our travel advice, and we always make sure our travel advice is as good as possible. And when I met my Iranian counterpart, uh, in September, I was very clear that there are key bilateral issues that we needed to resolve, namely the detainee issue, also the IMS issue. And of course, uh, we don't agree with Iran on many topics. You know, we're not naive uh, about the situation in Iran, but we need to absolutely make sure we're protecting our British nationals. That is my top priority, and that is what I will continue to work to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, after six years I can mention Azaleen Zaghari Radcliffe in the chamber and not beg for her release. So thank you, Mr Speaker. After eight urgent questions and countless debates, it's a pleasure to finally be standing here and talking about her. And this wouldn't have happened without the Foreign Secretary and the member for Braintree. So can I say thank you from the bottom of my heart and to all the FCO officials who I know worked tirelessly to make this happen. So thank you. I also wanted to thank Redress Gibson Dunn, Change UK and Amnesty International and other organisations and individuals who worked so hard to release Nazneen. And can I thank all the MPs on behalf of Richard Radcliffe who texted me just before I stood up to say thank you across the chamber because whichever side of the house you were in, you worked hard, everyone worked hard to make sure that Nazneen was released. So whichever party, whichever member, wherever, whichever constituency you represented, Thank you, and thank you from Richard Ratcliffe as well, yeah. including all the MPs who visited Richard when he was on both his hunger strikes. Yeah. 
and to the community, especially in West Hampstead, where Nazneen's home is, thank you for always coming and supporting us. But most importantly, I want to pay tribute to my constituent, Richard Radcliffe, for his relentless campaigning, but I also think he's really set the bar high for all husbands. <laughs> can I say... Can I say to Nazneen, Welcome home after six long years. And can I say to Gabriella, this time, mummy really is coming home. Yeah. I've finished by asking the Foreign Secretary, who I am very, very grateful to once mm. again, could she update us a bit more on why Murad Tabas wasn't allowed to leave Iran? He actually lived in my constituency as well <laughs> when he was in the UK. Right so I'd like to hear an update on that. Well, can I, can I thank the Honourable Lady for her tireless uh, campaigning and also her patience uh, in the last 24 hours? She and I have had a number of conversations, and it was only when we heard that the wheels were up in Tehran that we really knew it was happening. And you know, I was just extremely concerned to make sure that Nazanin and Nushe had really been able to leave Iran. And I'm so delighted that we are going to be able to welcome them home today and the family uh, is going to be able to welcome them home today. And she is absolutely right about Richard and Gabriella and the other families who have campaigned so tirelessly. And you know, it's, it's been an incredibly, an incredibly difficult time. And she's also right to pay tribute to my honourable friend, the middle the minister for the... I mean, he's now minister for the Middle East, Europe, Russia, <laughs> because he's so talented and gets so much done. But, you know, my honourable friend has held countless meetings as well uh, to make sure this happens. It's not been a, uh, an easy, easy process. On the subject of Morad Tabaz, the, the real issue is that he is a tri-national, and that is seen in Iranian eyes as also uh, meaning that the US are involved. And we are working uh, very closely with the US. We have secured his release from prison. Of course, we want to see him uh, come home, and we will continue to work to achieve that with our US partners. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. May I congratulate my right honourable friend and indeed all the team at the Foreign Office and the legal team, who I know will have worked extremely hard, and to everybody, including honourable members, uh, for their tireless work. Can uh, my right honourable friend assure me that in our adherence to the international rules based system, by paying the debt? that it was adjudged we owed to Iran. We shall not swaver from our belief that the arbitrary detention of nationals of whatever uh, uh, country is wrong, uh, and that we must redouble our efforts if we are to effectively defend the international rules-based system that she and I know is under unprecedented attack. My honourable friend is right that arbitrary detention is completely wrong. We are stepping up our efforts together with our G7 colleagues to work more closely together to challenge uh, that type of behaviour internationally. And I think over the uh, Ukraine uh, crisis and the abhorrent invasion of Ukraine by Russia, you have seen uh, the international community step up and democratic nations work together. And we are determined to address all of those issues, including the issue of arbitrary detention. We know comes the person who mentioned every Thursday, Val Rivas. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Can I start by thanking the Foreign Secretary for all her work and her minister who answered all the urgent questions and all the officials at the FCDO uh, throughout the six years. Um, I know my, uh, my honourable friends, the members for Hampstead and Kilburn and Lewisham East, uh, are delighted to get their constituents back, but none more so than the Radcliffe family, the wider Radcliffe family, who we all met on Richard's hunger strike, and, and Anoushe's family. Uh, they're pleased to get them back. And Murad Tabaz, uh, actually his birth certificate, which I've seen, was born in Hammersmith, so I hope we can make extra efforts. But I'd like to ask the Foreign Secretary if she will ensure that Mehran Raouf, even though he may not have asked for help, that he's not forgotten. <coughs> but Mr Speaker, this was house business, and the house is delighted that Nazanin and Anoushe 
are back in the loving arms of their family. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. And I can assure the Honourable Lady that every single British national who is unfairly detained overseas is on our minds and we are working to see them released. Catherine Fletcher. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, I, uh, the Foreign Secretary has rightly received many plaudits uh, for the work that her and her teams have done. And the people of South Liberal have been writing to me since I was first elected in 2019, urging her and her team to strain every sinew in difficult circumstances. It's not often that they can all go home from work putting that smile on that little girl's face. So will she join with me in saying thank you from South Ribble and to the, for their efforts? Well, this, this has been a team effort, and uh, as we've said, we've seen incredible fortitude and stoicism from the families, from those detained in Iran themselves, and of course, all of our constituents who are so deeply concerned about the terrible plight uh, that Nazanin and her family have faced. Sammy Wilson. And can I also add my congratulations to the Foreign Secretary for her tenacity and determination in resolving uh, these particular issues. I hope she shows the same tenacity and determination in resolving the issues which affect Northern Ireland as well uh, in her negotiations. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm sure I, don't, I didn't know the families. I met, I met Nazanin's husband once outside the Foreign Office when he was conducting his hunger strike. And he told me of the ups and downs and the hopes being raised and dashed um, continually. And I'm sure that the, the, the work which the Minister has done and her officials has given great help to the families who now have their loved ones released and hope to those who still are looking forward to having their families released. I know that the, the Minister had to link these two things together, but does, has she any concerns that linking the payment of money to the release of these hostages might send out the wrong signal to criminal regimes across the world who have no hesitation in using humans in this way? Well, to answer the Honourable Gentleman's first point, I will not give up until I have fixed the Northern Ireland Protocol. I can absolutely assure him, uh, I can assure him of that. And you know, these issues that are long-standing issues with Iran have been treated in parallel. I have been very clear, the government has been very clear, that this is legitimate debt that the UK government should pay. And that is right, and that is what we have done, and we have found a way of doing that despite uh, the various sanctions regimes that are in place, and we have made sure that it is spent on humanitarian support. Phil Clark. Mr Speaker, it is excellent news that three British nationals have been released from Iranian prisons today. Um, I met Richard Ratcliffe, Nazanin's husband, several years ago at a reception hosted by you, Mr Speaker, in this place to hear directly of her plight in detention. So I'm delighted that she has finally been released and is on her way home. So can I firstly congratulate my honourable friend for all her work, but also ask her to confirm that her department will continue to support other British nationals in Iran who have also asked for our help. We will continue to support British nationals in Iran, and all of the families have been provided with consular support, support from our officials, and I'm very proud of the uh, support that they have offered. But of course, we will continue to work to make sure uh, that those unfairly detained are able to return home. Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is brilliant and excellent news, and I thank the Foreign Secretary for the statement she's made today and congratulate the members for Lewisham and Hampstead and Kilburn for the work they put in. Could she give us any indication of when she expects um, Mera Tabaz to actually be released, because being on furlough is not a very satisfactory situation. He, obviously, he has the right to return to this country, as, uh, as do others. She mentioned that she can't name all the dual nationals or British nationals being held, and I understand that. But one in particular, Meran Roof, a labour rights activist, has been clearly publicly named by Amnesty International and Redress. And, um, is on apparently a long-term prison sentence. Could she tell us what efforts are being made to secure his release? And also, in this 
changed relationship we now have with Iran, which is welcome, will there now be a robust human rights dialogue with Iran? Because detention of uh, foreign nationals is appalling, but also there are many other human rights issues that deserve and must be raised with Iran. And I hope this will be the start of a serious dialogue, which hopefully will improve the human rights of everybody. Well, on the, on the subject of the individual that the Honourable Gentleman names, I do have to respect the individual's request uh, of whether or not their case should be raised in public, and uh, that is why uh, we only mention publicly uh, those individuals who have asked uh, to be named. But, of course, uh, we continue to supply support to all uh, British nationals who have been unfairly detained. And as I said previously, there are many issues over which we do not have agreement with Iran, but I will continue to talk uh, to the Iranian Foreign Minister and work with the Iranian Foreign Minister to make sure we do resolve issues between us that pertain to the British national interest. Dr Andrew Morrison. This news is like sunshine on a rainy day. Congratulations to all involved. Would she agree with me that particular tribute needs to be made to Sayyid Badia and the Omani government, who are establishing themselves as interlocutors and mediators par excellence in the region. And would she say what assurances she has got that the IRGC will simply not replace uh, Nazanin Anusha Murad uh, with other dual nationals? And will she reiterate her warnings to dual nationals who may fall within the Iranian jurisdiction uh, that they should tread very carefully indeed? Minister Badr and the Amani government have been incredibly yeah, helpful yeah, yeah, yeah. in assisting us with uh, this issue. And I want to pay tribute. They, uh, they flew uh, the detainees out uh, to Muscat. Uh, I've been in regular touch with Minister Badr since I first met him uh, in December last year, and they have been instrumental uh, in making their, that happen. And they are true friends uh, of the United Kingdom. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman is right in what he says about dual nationals, but fundamentally we need to change the incentives on the system so people can travel freely without fear of unfair detainment. Hilary Bell. Thank you very yeah, much yeah. indeed, Mr Speaker. May I join other members in thanking the Foreign Secretary, her officials, my two honourable friends and everyone who has brought this wonderful day to pass, made all the sweeter by the smiles that we see looking down on us from the gallery. The Foreign Secretary said that the debt was paid in parallel, but we all know that for the government of Iran, it was always sequential. And given what she said about the work she's doing with other G7 members, including Canada, to try and deal with this, what practical steps is she hoping to secure through this to ensure that in future it is much, much more difficult for governments to engage in hostage taking for political purposes. Yeah. Well, the, the, the right honourable gentleman is right that we do need to change the practice of countries detaining other countries' nationalities, nationals unfairly, and that is precisely what we are working on with our Canadian counterparts and others, but we need to act in concert to change the system and change the reactions uh, that we give overall. But I, I can't say more at this stage, but I hope to be able to say more soon. Should be right. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. This is a day of great joy and relief, not just for those flying home today, but also for their families, some of whom it's wonderful to be joined by today, but also for the wider families, including members of the Zagari Ratcliffe family who live in my constituency. I pay huge tribute to all involved, including, of course, my right honourable friend and uh, honourable members who sit opposite who have done such a tremendous job on behalf of their constituents. There will be many lessons wrongly drawn from this sad episode. Can I suggest to my right honourable friend there is one lesson that could be correctly drawn? The fact that these people were imprisoned in Iran is the fault of the Iranian regime. The difficulties that the UK government has faced repaying the IMS loan are also the fault of the Iranian regime. 
because they largely relate to sanctions imposed upon the Iranian regime. Is this a lesson of wider application in the world today, that if you find yourself subject to international sanctions, you will find there are long and expensive consequences? Well, my honourable friend makes a very effective point about sanctions and what we are seeing today in Russia, uh, the fact that the government of Russia is struggling uh, to finance uh, its appalling war in Ukraine, uh, the fact that people are struggling to secure the goods and services that they had become used to and the country has been returned to something akin to the Soviet era, shows that sanctions do work and are effective. Drew Hendrick. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The joy and relief uh, will be felt by all of our constituents who have been fully behind Richard Ratcliffe and the families in terms of getting their loved ones home. Given that there has been a solution in plain sight, which the Foreign Secretary has been able to use today, does she agree that it should never again take two hunger strikes, the terms of three Prime Ministers, five Foreign Secretaries and five Ministers for the Middle East to get a solution for people in this situation in the future? This is an issue that the Foreign Office has been working on tirelessly uh, for many years. Given there was a new government in Tehran uh, last summer, given there was an opportunity to reset the relationship and to start working on these issues afresh, we took that opportunity, but we were only able to do it because of the tireless work of Foreign Office officials. It is not easy, as uh, my right honourable friend pointed out, to be able to pay the IMS debt in the current uh, scenario, and we did find a way to do it, uh, and I'm very pleased that we have. Simon Hall. Mr Speaker, the plaudits that my right honourable friend is receiving today are richly deserved, and she and the other ministers and officials deserve the warm applause of the House. She has said she can't go into all the details about the humanitarian aid, but can she assure us that that would be humanitarian aid which Iran will spend within country? Because the definition of humanitarian aid will change. We know that Mr Putin is calling for allies in the Middle East to help him in his humanitarian work in the Ukraine, and we need to make very certain that those sums are not deployed in that arena. And whilst I've got her attention, as she has a magic wand to solve very long-standing problems, can she now turn her attentions to Libya and redress for those victims of IRA terrorism from Libyan-sponsored atrocities? I can assure the, uh, honourable, my honourable friend that the definition of humanitarian aid in this, in this uh, agreement is certainly not uh, the definition of humanitarian aid that Vladimir Putin would subscribe to. Ali Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I know the joy my constituents of Lewisham West and Penge will be feeling at today's news, and I thank the Foreign Secretary for her work. I had the privilege of meeting Richard Ratcliffe when he was on hunger strike uh, last uh, winter. His dignity, courage and resolve was humbling, but I recall his frustration over delay after delay after delay. A mother and their child should never be separated for all these years. The Foreign Secretary must ensure that lessons aren't learned, are learned, so that, as she says, this never happens uh, again. And I'll be grateful for her comments as to how she uh, intends that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are all very, very pleased that the families are able to be reunited. I mean, in dealing with this issue, and I've been working on it since I became Foreign Secretary in September, there are a lot of complexities and there are difficulties in working given uh, the sanctions regime, given the process that needs to be gone through and hours and hours have been put into the meetings, the phone calls and getting this right and right up until the last minute uh, which came at one o'clock uh, this afternoon you know, it, it, it's always been touch and go. So I would just say to your honourable lady that there is an incredible amount of complexity uh, lying underneath in terms of what 
we have to do and what our counterpart governments have to do uh, to be able to affect these types of change. But I'm uh, very clear that uh, we do have some excellent officials who have really done the business yeah, yeah, on the ground yeah, yeah, yeah. in Tehran. Yeah. Ian Duncan Smith. Speaker, can I congratulate my right honourable friend and uh, both our right honourable friends for the work that they've done in delivering this in short order after such a long period of frustration and obviously those of our honourable colleagues who have been campaigning for this. Uh, can I pay tribute uh, to Richard Radcliffe, who today must feel unalloyed joy uh, that the love that he has shown to his wife has allowed him to campaign through adversity to deliver this day, and I therefore pay tribute to him completely. Can I also say, however, to my honourable friend, that as we look forward, um, and people are dying in the Ukraine to fight for freedom, uh, we are learning a lesson, and that lesson surely has application here. It is that when states behave beyond the rule of law, we need to act swiftly and immediately isolate them with sanctions. And this, therefore, in the future, the unlawful taking of uh, prisoners uh, in a case like this ever again, the West must unite, the whole world must unite in immediately bringing sanctions against those countries such that the pain they will feel outweighs any of the gain they think they may receive. Chair of State. Well, my, my right honourable friend is absolutely correct, and this is uh, why. Uh, it's important that the West and the wider free world has stepped up uh, in the Ukraine crisis. For too many years, frankly, we didn't do enough, and blind eyes were turned to uh, some of these egregious practices. And that is why, as well as the work we are doing together to impose sanctions on Russia for their appalling actions in Ukraine, we are also working together on the issue of unfair detention so that we protect the rules-based system and we defend freedom and democracy around the world. And this lot. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, this is very good news, but it's not the end of the matter. Even if the Foreign Secretary won't discuss individual cases, she should be aware that there are a number of UK citizens of dual nationals still held in Iran, and some, for good reason, will not be as well known as Nazarene. So will she meet with the MPs and the families whose relatives are still detained in Iran? And what leverage does she think she will now have that the debt has been paid? What is well, of course, I will continue to meet with families of detained individuals, and I will continue to work uh, to get those people uh, released from unfair detention. David Munda. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Foreign Secretary is to be rightly commended for achieving this uh, joyous outcome. But will she join with me in commending the thousands of ordinary people across the United Kingdom who do not know uh, uh, Nazarene or Richard or Anusha personally, but yet have stood firmly with them throughout uh, all these years and have kept us MPs honest by relentlessly pursuing us to raise the issue in Parliament, to engage with Richard in his uh, hunger strikes and other uh, efforts. And doesn't it just show that it is always worthwhile, however uh, complex the issue, for members of the public to engage with an issue? For a secretary. Well, this issue has touched the hearts of the British public, and I know we've all seen that as MPs uh, in our postbads. And who can fail to be moved by the courage and tenacity shown by the families, but also the suffering uh, that has been undergone uh, by those unfairly detained and those who've been separated from them for so many years? And you know, I think we're seeing with the uh, offers of the British public to offer homes for Ukrainian. Uh, refugees that the British public are big hearted and we do want to see uh, our citizens thrive and we do want to see these families reunited. Christian Matheson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I add my congratulations and thanks to the Foreign Secretary and her team and particularly to my honourable friends for their tireless campaign and to Mr Ratcliffe, who I've met on several occasions in difficult circumstances. Moving beyond today's announcements, we know that Iran is a difficult and multi-layered country to do dealings with. Is there any hope 
of uh, perhaps it's moving towards um, a, a more uh, accommodating arrangement uh, with the rest of the world and that perhaps it, we might be able to not normalise but uh, improve relations slightly in the long run. Foreign Secretary. Well, in resolving the issue of the IMS debt and in resolving the issue of these particular unfairly detained detainees, we have dealt with two of the major issues facing uh, the UK and Iran. Of course, we have very large concerns about Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon, and that is what we are currently working on with partners, is to prevent that happening, because we know uh, when a uh, nuclear state uh, poses a danger to the world, where that can lead. Uh, so that is really our focus, working with partners and directly engaging, of course, with the Iranian government, as I have. Drummond. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I also add my thanks to the Foreign Secretary and also her predecessors, who have been badgered by many years, well, particularly the last six years, um, and I am so pleased that she put it as one of her priorities. But can I also pay tribute to uh, the families of Anusha and Nazanin, especially Richard Ratcliffe, um, and the family who I met outside of the FCDO during the hunger strike. Um, but also, can, we, can my right hon. Friend um, join with me in thanking the British negotiating team in Tehran, who have been working so hard to get the three British citizens released? And can I ask her, does she think that this is the beginning of a new relationship with Iran for the long term? Foreign Secretary. Uh, she is right to pay tribute to the family, to Richard Ratcliffe, to all the work he's done campaigning, but also to our negotiating team, who have worked day in, day out, including in Tehran and also in Muscat, uh, to, get, to get this done. Uh, and that, that has been uh, really important. As to the question of the future of Iran, that is a choice for the Iranian government. Now, we don't want to see Iran acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, we do want to uh, see a world in which Iran pays a more positive role. And of course, we will work to encourage a more positive trajectory. Alice Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. S uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg your pardon. Can I thank and welcome the words of the Foreign Secretary in relation to arbitrary detention? Uh, I think that does come to the heart of it. Of course, arbitrary detention is not just the sole preserve of Iran. Mm -hmm. It is also a common practice in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where it is reported there were a further three executions today while the Prime Minister was in country. Can the Foreign Secretary give me some assurance that we shall pursue the issue of arbitrary detention and other human rights abuses with equal vigour wherever we find them? Foreign Secretary. We approach our relations with all countries without fear or favour, and we are prepared to be honest uh, with countries about human rights practices. That is exactly what the Prime Minister has been doing on his visit. But it is important that we do engage Saudi Arabia. We have a major issue, as everybody in this House knows, with a very aggressive Russia that has threatened uh, European, indeed global security. And we need to work with other countries to find alternative sources of oil and gas and it is important that we deal with everybody. Rob Butler. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Today is, of course, a day of uh, celebration, albeit tempered by the recollection of the suffering that has been endured by Nazneen and Nusheh Murad uh, and their families for a long period of time. Uh, some people may be concerned at the parallel payment of almost £400 million. So can my right hon. Friend reassure the House that this is money that was legitimately owed to Iran, and nobody should be under any misapprehension that this government would pay ransoms for people who are illegally detained anywhere in the world. Foreign Secretary. Well, my honourable friend is right. We have always been clear that this is legitimately owed money that the UK should be paying. Uh, due to the complexity, that has been a difficult issue, but we have been, uh, we have been challenging in the way we have been looking at the ways that we can pay that money, ensuring, of course, that it is spent on humanitarian purposes. That has been absolutely critical, and we have found a solution to resolve that issue. Wayne David. Could I say, like other members in the House, I am truly delighted at the release of uh, Anashu and uh, Nazanin. 
And could I also pay tribute to, to Richard, who has been a, a tower of strength in this whole unfortunate saga. Could I also congratulate, too, the, uh, the Foreign Secretary on her role and her, as she says, creative civil servants who found a way to repay this historic loan. As we often say, where there is a will, there is a way, and that has certainly been proven to be the case. But could I ask her about the, the role of uh, the government of Oman? I understand from her that the, the government of Oman has been uh, playing a very positive role. But is it the case that the role was such that the uh, money was actually transferred to Iran via the Oman Central Bank? Well, our Omani friends have been extremely helpful uh, working with us uh, to help transport uh, the detainees between uh, Tehran and uh, the United Kingdom, but also working with us on some of the practical arrangements around the detainees and working closely with the Iranian government. We have also had, of course, direct contact with the Iranian government too, but it has been a truly successful partnership in helping this happen. Scott Benton. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. May I congratulate the Foreign Secretary on her work to secure the safe release and return of Nazazine. Yeah, yeah. Iran's malign influence continues to remain a threat to British interests in the Middle East and indeed to those of our allies, most notably Israel. What steps is the government taking to ensure that any new agreement on Iran's nuclear weapon programme prevents them from acquiring nuclear weapons? Foreign Secretary. It is correct that we have very strong concerns about the ability of Iran uh, to acquire a nuclear weapon. That is why we have been working so closely uh, with our allies through the JCPOA to get a new deal uh, to stop that acquisition. It is vitally important. We do want Iran to take a different path, a better path, and that comes with a combination, in my view, of being absolutely clear about what the penalties are, namely the sanctions, but also having a positive choice uh, that Iran can make about its future. Chris Bryant. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mr. Speaker. I warmly commend the Foreign Secretary and all her team, ministerial and, and officials, on, on this result. Apricity means the feeling of the sun on your face in winter. And I'm sure that for Gabriella and for Richard, today is a day of apricity, sun on their face in a time of winter. Um, however, uh, authoritarian regimes such as Iran and Russia do two things very similarly. They do um, arbitrary detention that she's already spoken about, but they also pump their propaganda around the world through state-funded broadcasters. In Iran's case, that is press TV. Thank goodness it's not got a license here anymore. Um, I personally think that anybody who's taken money from press TV should be giving it back. But shouldn't exactly the same apply to Russia today? Isn't it time it was closed down so we stopped hearing the propaganda from Russia about Ukraine? And shouldn't everybody who's taken money from them give it back or give it to, to Ukrainian refugee support? Foreign Secretary. Well, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right about state-funded propaganda and the fact that we don't see a free media in many parts of the world. And in fact, in some cases, social media has broken that up, and we've seen some of that in Russia, although it's now being cracked down on. This is one of the reasons that the government has established the information unit, to help give the Russian people the truth about what's happening in their own country. I know my right honourable friend, the Culture Secretary, is looking at precisely the issue the honourable gentleman talks about, and I'm sure she will be listening very carefully to his question today. Ruth Jones. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And this is the most joyous of days for this House and the country, and, and for a family who have missed Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe, a wife, a mum, a daughter, and a sister in law. And in Newport West, this case is personal because Richard Ratcliffe's sister, Rebecca Jones, is a constituent of mine, and I've watched in awe as she fought to get Nazanin home alongside the rest of the family. And I say to the Minister, for all the joy today, a case, case like this must never happen again. So will the Secretary of State ensure lessons are learned so no other family has to go through such a dreadful separation yeah. from a loved one in the future? Yeah. Yeah. Secretary. Well, I congratulate her constituent on the work she's done to campaign for Nazanin's release. And she is right, we cannot let this happen again. 
And this needs to be about what we do as the United Kingdom, but also how we work with our international allies to make sure there are not incentives in place for these regimes to carry out arbitrary detention. Russian Deputy Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is right and proper that the House congratulate the Foreign Secretary and their ministerial team on delivering on real diplomatic action. Uh, it is great to see. Uh, and also to the honourable members for uh, Hampstead and Kilburn and Lewisham East, uh, a job well done for being parliamentary representatives. It is a great honour to sit in any parliament, and that is the job of an MP, and of course to the families who are watching. I was interested to hear the Foreign Secretary talk about arbitrary detention and how we can work with other countries to ensure that not only dual nationals or tri nationals, but full UK nationals are not arbitrarily detained, no matter. <coughs> Their friendships with countries. And further to, I think it was the member for Hammersmith who is no longer in their place, uh, the Foreign Secretary said that they were meeting with uh, families who are detained. And that spirit of collaboration and working together, I wonder, therefore, would the Foreign Secretary consider meeting with me and the family of Jagtar Singh Johal to understand the issue yeah. of arbitrary detention yeah, yeah. for other states? It yeah, would be a most welcome deliberation for the future. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as I have said to the honourable gentleman, I have raised uh, this specific case, but I would be happy to meet him to discuss it further. Mike Kane. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy yeah. Speaker. The American academic Margaret Mead famously said, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Uh, nothing else in history ever has done so. Well done to the Foreign Secretary, her Minister, her Department, and to my friends from Lewisham East and uh, ha uh, Hampstead and Kilburn. Their work in this has been indefatigable. I don't want to strike a discordant note, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, but the members for the Shadow Foreign Secretary, the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, the members for Leeds and Antrim have alluded to this deal. I think all of us in Parliament would be happier if there was some briefing, if there was some scrutiny, if it's done on Privy Council terms even. Foreign Secretary. Well, I, I hear what the Honourable Gentleman says. We do have an arrangement, and this was part of the very careful negotiations that have taken place over the last six months, that this deal uh, would be kept confidential. We do have the humanitarian assurances on the IMS front. I will see what I can do uh, within the bounds of that, but I, I do have to say to the honourable gentleman, the United Kingdom is a country that keeps its word. We have made, a, made our word to keep this confidential. Last question, Margaret Ferrier. This is a good day, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, the release of Nazarene and Anoushe is extremely welcome news, and I thank the Foreign Secretary and her officials. And I pay tribute to the families for their bravery, courage and resilience. I didn't want to have to see Richard go on a third hunger strike. So given the length of time they were detained and the other dual nationals continue to be detained in Iran, can she set out how she will ensure that lessons are learned for the government from these cases, including in relation to the provision of consular services for UK nationals and their families more generally? Foreign Secretary. Well, I thank, I thank the Honourable Lady. I think we have seen some very good consular services in, the, in these cases and other cases. I think the lesson to be learnt is this broader lesson about arbitrary detention and how do we work with our allies and partners to stop it. And I will uh, update the House on the progress of uh, this arbitrary detention work that we are undertaking with the Canadians. We first discussed it uh, back in November, in fact, at the uh, NATO Foreign Ministers Summit. Uh, we discussed it again at the G7 meeting, and we are making some real progress on this. So I'd be very happy to have further discussions in due course. I do thank the um, Foreign Secretary for her uh, statement, and we now move on to ah, point of order, Angela Rayner. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Earlier today, I asked the Deputy Prime Minister whether the Prime Minister had ever asked anyone to urge the security services to reverse, reconsider or withdraw their assessment of Lord Le uh, Lebedev of Hampton and Siberia. He replied that the suggestion was sheer nonsense. But this afternoon, the Prime Minister's former Chief Advisor has stated in writing that the Prime Minister was told the intelligence services had 
serious reservations but cut a deal to provide the Commission with a sanitised version of the advice. The Ministerial Code requires Ministers to correct the record if they have inadvertently misled the House, as the former Downing Street Chief of Staff has alleged. So can the Madam Deputy Speaker tell me if she has had any notice from the Deputy Prime Minister that he intends to come to the House to correct the record? And if not, can she advise me on how the House can get the truth of this very serious issue? Uh, well, I'm uh, grateful to the uh, Right Honourable Lady um, for her point of order and for giving me notice of it. Um, as she will know, um, the Speaker is not responsible for ministerial answers. 